Hello, my name is Christina Marmer, and I am Momentum's Director of Content and Experience and Program Director of Momentum's fourth annual Food and Beverage Litigation, Compliance, and Regulatory Exchange. It is my great pleasure to be here today with Kara McCall and Sarah Goldstein of Sidley Austin. Kara and Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Kara McCall, partner at Sidley, focuses her practice on the defense of companies in class action litigation, product liability and mass tort, and complex commercial litigation matters. Most recently, her practice has focused on the defense of food, beverages, nutritional supplements, and construction products in class action litigation arising out of alleged mislabeling or other deceptive trade practices. Sarah Goldstein, attorney at Sidley, focuses her practice on Food and Drug Administration regulatory requirements in the food space, primarily relating to FISMA, labeling of conventional foods and dietary supplements, and food safety issues. Most recently, Sarah has advised clients on implementation of several key rules under FISMA, new FDA requirements for restaurant menu labeling, and dietary supplement claim substantiation. So Sarah, I'd like to start with you with a couple of questions, um, if that's okay. That sounds great. Sounds great. Sarah, we all know that companies are spending a significant amount of time and resources to bring their facilities and practices into compliance with the various new requirements in FISMA. Are there certain provisions that companies are finding to be the most challenging? Sure. So I would say that there's really a range of issues confronting FDA-regulated food companies. Um, some smaller companies are actually struggling to figure out whether certain FISMA rules even apply to them, which is harder than it sounds um, because the regulations are lengthy and complex. For example, certain requirements under the preventive controls rule don't apply to dietary supplement manufacturers, but they do apply to manufacturers of dietary ingredients. So companies really need to be aware of the nuances. Um, another example that comes to mind is that some companies have mixed type facilities where some of the activities are subject to FDA registration and therefore the preventive controls requirements and some are not. So there's quite a bit to parse out in terms of who's subject to various provisions of the rules. Beyond that, many companies are finding uh, two of the rules, the preventive controls and the foreign supplier verification programs or FSVP rules to be the most challenging for them, probably because they're the meatiest of the major rules. Most companies subject to the preventive controls rule will need to do quite a bit of work, uh, including an in-depth food safety plan, which will require a hazard analysis, uh, implementation of preventive controls, monitoring, corrective actions where necessary, verification, and record keeping. And then companies that are required to comply with the FSVP rule that I mentioned will need to ensure that they have a verification program in place for all of the foods that they import, unless they're exempt. And I should mention that for that rule, uh, the importer, as defined in the rule, is technically the entity that's responsible for compliance. So an FSVP will include approving suppliers, conducting a hazard analysis uh, for the imported foods, and verification activities, among other requirements. And then companies are also trying to figure out whether they should participate in voluntary programs under FISMA and whether that makes sense for their specific situations. Uh, for example, FDA is in the process of establishing the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, or VQIP, um, to expedite the review of food that's imported by participants in the program. So in order to participate, importers would need to meet uh, pretty significant eligibility criteria and they would have to pay a user fee, but they stand to gain important benefits from the program in terms of making it much easier for them to import food. So FDA has indicated that it intends to publish the final uh, guidance for the program this summer and it will accept applications beginning in January 2018. So companies are also, in addition to figuring out compliance with all of the required rules, they're weighing the costs and benefits of of voluntary programs like VQIP. Great. So along those similar lines, Sarah, are there certain parts of FISMA that the FDA has indicated will be the most important to them? Has the government given any guidance whatsoever regarding how companies should prioritize or how it will approach the enforcement of the various requirements? 
Sure. Um, I think first off, I would say that it's important to note the staggered compliance dates for the major FISMA rules. The final rules have been released over time, and accordingly, FDA has set out compliance dates that really vary and sort of cascade for each of the rules. So, for instance, the compliance date for most companies for the preventive controls rule is in September 2016, so just a few months from now, but companies will have um, until about mid-2017 to comply with the FSCP rule. And then some of the other rules don't require compliance for quite some time after that. For example, the rule on intentional adulteration was just published in May, and the earliest compliance date, um, which will be for most large companies for that rule, is in 2019. So FDA understands that you know, these rules are significant. They require a major investment of time and money from companies that are subject to them. And the agency has built in what it believes is a reasonable amount of compliance time for that reason. Uh, with, expect in, with respect to enforcement overall, uh, companies should expect more inspections from FDA, given that that was part of the agency's mandate under FSMA. And we should also expect the agency to be, of course, most concerned about any shortcomings or violations that could pose a public health risk. Um, the agency has also established the Technical Assistance Network, or the TAN. So through that, it's going to provide assistance, and actually already has been um, for a bit of time now, to, to help companies understand the FISMA rules, to respond to questions about them, and to help with implementation strategies for the rules. And notably, the agency expects the TAN to be available in real time once those inspections under the preventive controls rules actually kick in. And one other thing I would note um, is that the agency has promised to issue additional guidance in the coming months to help companies implement the final rules. So we anticipate that those documents are also going to be helpful in terms of better understanding what obligations companies have under the rules and to help them prioritize their compliance. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Kara, I have a couple of questions for you. So we're going to pass the mic on over to you. It seems to be that the regulatory folks at food companies that are working most diligently on FISMA implementation, but you've told us in the past that you think that it's the litigators need to be up to speed as well. Why is this? Food companies have to think of these issues holistically. Primarily, this is because almost every negative regulatory activity, for example, a warning letter, a consent decree, et cetera, it's going to result in either products liability or consumer fraud litigation. And put another way, the, the additional scrutiny and inspections by the FDA that we're, going to re, that we're going to see as a result of FINSA really creates opportunity for more litigation. Um, additional written plan and strategy requirements also create opportunity for more discovery in any litigation, even litigation that's not related to FISMA compliance. And the written food safety plan, particularly if it's not actually followed, could be exhibit number one in any litigation involving your company. So but the important thing to keep in mind is that in litigation, Failure to comply with regulations or with internal policies or procedures can be devastating, even if, at the end of the day, any failure is not actually a cause of the foodborne illness or whatever the litigation about. It's simply going to make the company look bad. And even if it's a red herring, it will be a dangerous one in front of a judge or jury. And speaking of foodborne illness, while that is the most likely litigation context in which your FISMA compliance could come under attack, any failure to comply with, with FISMA could lead to a consumer fraud class action as well. That is, someone will argue that I would not have bought that food product if I had known that it was stored in a facility that was not FISMA compliant, or I wouldn't have paid as much as I paid if I had not known, or if I had known, sorry. So again, even if the lack of compliance does not actually impact the quality of the food, there is still litigation risk. So Kara, it, would it just be the food companies that actually market their name brand products that should be primarily concerned? Or what about the food companies that are simply ingredient suppliers or in the distribution chain? 
I mean, as we all know, all companies now in the distribution chain have responsibilities under FISMA. And while there are certain parts of FISMA that allow companies to delegate responsibility, for instance, to customers or subsequent entities in the distribution chain, the delegation that's permitted under the regulatory provisions does not necessarily mean that you are delegating or passing on liability in litigation. For instance, under the preventive controls rule, a manufacturing facility is not required to implement a preventive control for an identified hazard if the company relies on its customer or a subsequent entity in the distribution chain to control that hazard and certain other requirements are met. As another example, while the sanitary transportation rule applies across the chain of food, trans food transportation, which means that shippers, receivers, carriers, and loaders are subject to the rule, responsibility for certain obligations can be shifted among the parties by written agreement. But the fact that responsibility for FISMA compliance can be shifted does not necessarily mean that the shifting party is absolved of all possible litigation liability. In litigation, it's not unheard of for all parties in the distribution chain, farmers, suppliers, packagers, distributors, retailers, to be named as defendants. And to be sure, there are mechanisms, both contractual and at common law, for shifting liability and litigation to the party that is most able to control for liability and damages. But that does not mean that any party will be able to get out of litigation early, much less avoid it entirely. So yes, even companies that have not historically been targets in litigation, such as wholesalers or distributors, should recognize that their litigation risk is no doubt increasing and expanding in scope as all companies in the distribution chain are subject to stricter enforcement requirements. Kara, what kind of advice should litigators be giving to the regulatory, regulatory folks while they work on FISMA implementation in order to mitigate the risk of litigation, or at the very least, prepare themselves for litigation that may occur related to a FISMA violation? Well, this sounds pretty obvious, but you have to actually follow and comply with the written plans that you're creating under FISMA. One of our concerns is that companies are going to be so focused on their hazard analysis plan and the other written documentation and record keeping requirements that they actually lose sight of the bigger picture, which is whether they're actually following the plan that they put into place. While FISMA has many potentially burdensome requirements, they are tailored to and dependent upon a company's specific situation. This is evident, for example, in the fact that each company subject to the preventive controls rule conducts its own hazard analysis and determines the best way to control the identified hazards. It's also evident in FDA's decision to provide companies with flexibility under the sanitary transportation rule to apportion responsibility among the various participants in the supply chain. But I think what the in-house folks can do is to help their regulatory and business folks keep their eye on compliance in practice, not just in writing. And part of this, of course, is in not promising in a plan to do something that's impossible or nearly impossible to do in practice. I think, I think companies should also be very careful about the extraneous documents and communications that are undoubtedly being created as part of the process of getting your ducks in a row to comply with FISMA. For example, a company should ha try to have that process take place under the direction of counsel to try to protect communications and drafts under the attorney-client privilege. Um, as another tip, employees should be careful that in putting together new plans and procedures, they don't criticize in writing the previous plans and procedures. We see emails all the time that say, oh wow, this new plan is so much detailed than the old one. This seems pretty vanilla, but if somehow the old plan comes under attack in litigation, that document will not be helpful. And another related tip is that to the extent that shortcomings are identified in the plans that are being put into place, those should be acknowledged in writing and someone should explain in writing why that shortcoming can't be fixed or can't be fixed completely. For instance, if someone says, well, we can't write up this part of the plan because we don't have the information we need from the supplier. 
Someone should follow up again in writing with a detailed description of what you have done to get that information so that it's clear from the documents that you have done the necessary due diligence. Um, you know, we've talked a lot today about this interplay between regulatory and litigation, and this is really one of the key themes that's going to be covered at this year's Momentum Food and Beverage Litigation, Compliance, and Regulatory Exchange in Chicago, which is occurring this year, September 29th and 30th at Loyola. I know that Sarah and I both agree that your regulatory lawyers have to know what litigation looks like and our litigation lawyers have to understand the regulatory framework in order to truly mitigate all types of risk. Uh, we look forward to discussing these and similar issues with you in September at Loyola. Tara and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing more from you uh, at the Food and Beverage Litigation Compliance and Regulatory Exchange in September. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. It was our pleasure.